Well, thank you, John Boyens. Well, I'm glad to be here. I'd love to talk about Tractor Supply Company. So let's start off with a little quiz. How many of you shop at Tractor Supply? Oh, fantastic. How many of you own a horse? We love you. <laughs> you all know what a horse is, don't you? A horse is a giant expensive pet. And Tractor Supply is a pet store for horses. So those of you who don't have a horse, you need to get one. Uh, well, let's share, talk to you about Tractor Supply. Give me a little history and, the, and I'll tell you the story about how the company was founded and tell you about what the success factors are that, that, that led to, to the company's current performance. So let's start off with a couple of charts here. This is a map of where Tractor Supply stores are located today. That says there are 10,085 stores. There are actually more than 1,100 stores today. We're in 45 states and continuing to grow. And the company recently announced that they will be able to double the number of stores over the next some number of years. So there's lots of room for, for future growth. Now the second chart shows that, shows that the store growth over the last 15 years. And you can see that when charts go up and to the right, that's good news. And, and then the next chart shows you the sales over the last 15 years. And last year we passed the $4 billion mark. Been a tremendous, tremendous success story. And Tractor Supply is a national based company, actually in Brentwood today. But very often we sort of fall into the radar screen. People don't know who we are. We're located in rural areas. But uh, Tractor Supply is a pretty good sized company. When you think about retailers, Tractor Supply is larger than Neiman Marcus, larger than Michaels, larger than uh, uh, Abercrombie, Burlington Coat Factory, Tiffany. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good sized company spread all over the country. We employ about 18,000 people today. I want to go back and share a historic. Can you give me the history of the company tell you how it got started. The company was founded in 1938. I was not there. <laughs> it was founded in Chicago by a man named Charles Schmidt. And uh, Charlie, this is a typical story, he sat around the kitchen table with some of his buddies and he decided to get into the tractor parts business. He was going to sell tractor parts uh, through mail order and he was going to be the Walmart of the tractor parts business. He was going to sell, you know, instead of going to the John Deere dealer and spending $100, you were going to Get it through the mail from Charlie for $65. That was the essence of how the business got started. Uh, they immediately went to opening retail stores, and retail stores has always been the core of the business, and the mail order uh, lasted until the early 1980s. Uh, the first store was in Minot, North Dakota, and that was it was in Minot because that was close to Canada, and apparently you could not mail order parts in Canada in those days. The second store was in Williston, North Dakota, and the third store was in Omaha, Nebraska. And the stores were fairly small. They were located near the stockyards. Now, in those days, farmers used to rebuild the engines in their tractors every year. They would take the engine apart and they'd put in new piston rings and sleeve sets and bearings and God knows what all else. I never did that kind of thing, but that was what farmers did in those days. It was a big parts business. So these stores were carrying parts, tractor parts of all kinds, and they were carrying lubricants and tires and batteries for tractors and some cutting parts for cutting hay. And it was really a parts store. It was near the stockyards, so when a farmer came to town to, to sell his cows, he'd, he'd drop them over the stockyard and he'd come over to, to the tractor supply store and buy his parts. Well, over the next uh, 30 years or so, the company grew, the stores became larger, many of them moved away from the stockyards, uh, and the company continued to grow. In 1938, there were six million farms in America. 30 years later, there were 3 million farms. So Mr. Schmidt was faced with, the company was faced with, with, with two dilemmas. One is the number of farms was continuing to decline from 6 million to 3 million. And, and, and the parts business was, was going away. When, when I was young, I used to do some repairs on my car. Nobody does that anymore. Nobody does it on tractors. So that whole tractor parts business was, was drying up. Tractors became more dependable, needed less repair, and it became larger and larger. Uh, and, and he tried a number of different ways to divert the business into different categories, and he had modest success in some areas. And then in 1969, he decided he'd had enough of this, and he wanted to, to move on, and, and the company was acquired. Well, I didn't tell you, the company was a public company in 1957, and, and did very, very well. But then the company was acquired in 1969 by a conglomerate, big company in Louisville, and it, it, Tractor Supply became the subsidiary of this great big company. Charlie went on down, he went to Florida to Bunker Raton and got into the banking business and made himself another fortune. Passed away about 15 years ago. 
Tractor Supply was now a, a, a subsidiary in a conglomerate, and that conglomerate got absorbed by another conglomerate, which was in Atlanta, and, and we now were one of 30 subsidiaries uh, in this great big company called Fuqua Industries in Atlanta. And during this period from 1969 to about 1981, the company had five presidents. And as you might imagine, president number one took the company in this direction, and president number two took it in this direction, and it was really a, a decade of chaos. And I joined the company, not knowing exactly what I was doing, with the four, under the fourth president, who had uh, taken a different tact, and that tact wasn't very successful. Uh, one thing he did that, that, that we all thought was great is we uh, uh, moved the company from Chicago, when I first joined the company, to, to Nashville. Uh, that was in the summer of 1979. Uh, a year and a half later, uh, he was asked to leave the company, and into the company came a fellow who had been with the parent of Fuqua Industries for 30 years, named Tom Hennessy. Tom was there as a, as a caretaker. He was there while the company had a search out to try and find a new CEO for the company. Tom did a couple of very smart things in the very beginning. He gave us a sense of stability. He pointed the company in a pretty clear direction, and he decided he really liked this business. And I worked with him closely and tried to help him. I was a young Turk, and he was a more senior, mature executive. And, uh, he, he decided he really liked this business, and he took a business plan to the parent company in Atlanta, whom he'd been with for 30 years, and said, here's my business plan. And he presented a very good plan. He said, I want to be president of Tractor Supply. And so the parent company says, OK, Tom, we trust you. We know you. You now are the president of the company. So he came back from Atlanta came into the office and he called me in and he sat down with me and he said, Joe, I don't know why he sat down with me at that point because there were half a dozen other vice presidents and he laid out his business plan, he laid out a table of organization and he said, Joe, I'm going to be the new president and I'm going to run merchandising and I'm going to run operations and I'm going to run real estate and we're going to create a new position over here called senior vice president and the senior vice president is going to have logistics and accounting and technology and marketing and personnel and I'm thinking to myself, where is he going to find this dude? And he looks at me and he said, Joe, that's your job. And it was the biggest surprise of my life. Uh, but it landed me in a, in, in a role that, that has, has shaped my life and, and, uh, and, and it's just been the most rewarding thing I could ever dream of. So Tom and I, along with some other fellows, we began to, the team began to solidify and we began to move forward. Now, from a financial standpoint, in 1980, the year before Tom took over, the company did $100 million in sales and lost $12 million. Terrible numbers. Tom's first year, we did $110 million and we lost $5 million. The third year, 1982, uh, we did $123 million and broke even. And from there on, it's been a, been a chart like you just saw up here a little while ago. So Tom's, things are beginning to solidify. 19, 81, we're moving forward, the sales are going up, we closed a couple of lousy stores and opened one or two good ones. Things are going in the right direction. And then, the beginning of 1982, the fellows from Atlanta, from the parent company, come up and they say, boys, we love you, but you, along with half a dozen other subsidiaries, are for sale. And so here we are, we're, we're working like mad, we think we're going in the right direction, and now we're for sale. And we go through 1982, for those of you who remember, interest rates were how high? 18%, 20%? Nobody was doing much of anything. And toward the end of the year, a deal maker came to us, a former Price Waterhouse partner, and he said, boys, let me show you how you can buy the company. And we thought this was a cool idea. And uh, he, he helped put together a deal with the parent company. He, he brought in some investors from New York, three guys who were just wonderful. They happened, two of them happened to be uh, the, the, the people that ran the Woodstock Rock Festival, which creates another whole list of stories that I can tell some of us. So we, 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 made, we had a partnership with these, there were three, three equity guys from New York, the deal maker, and five of us in management, Tom and myself and three others. We bought the company on a shoestring and we closed on December 27, 1982, and we had our back against the wall and we, we couldn't, we don't know how we were gonna make things work, but we did. It was interesting, we were, we were very pressed the, the first spring before sales started going crazy as they do in the spring, invoices started coming in and we ran out of money, and so, we used to sit there Friday afternoon when the checks came out and say, well, we'll pay you, we'll pay you. Hey, Charlie, can you wait three weeks over here? And we, we, well, we got through it, we got through it just fine. And, uh, three years later, we, we the three equity guys from New York, we paid them off three and a half times their investment.
and the five of us owned the company. Went forward running the company. From that point forward, we opened stores, we closed stores, we grew the company slowly. We solidified ourselves together as a team. Uh, there were five of us who owned the company, five partners. It's, I like to say that's like having four wives. But we, we, we learned how to work together very well, and, uh, and the company did well. In 1990 or so, Tom decided he wanted to retire. Uh, we bought Tom's stock back. I became the CEO, and, uh, and we moved forward. In 1994, we went public, and the company has continued to grow and continued to prosper uh, ever since then. I stepped down in 2005 and retired entirely in 2007. Uh, so just a, a, two words about the history of the company. If, if you were to look at the company today and you say, okay, in the 30 years since 1981, there have been three CEOs, Hennessy, and today Jim Wright. And, and, and you would know there are different personalities and different names on the doors, but you would know that the value structure in the company had not changed. We're passionate about our people, we're passionate about our customers, always doing the right thing with our suppliers and the right thing in the communities. So things have not, the value structure of the company has not changed one bit over those 30 years, which is a big part of the, of the continuing success. And then if you were smart enough in 1994 to buy a share of stock for $20 when we went public, today you, need your, you may need a little mental calculation here, you would now have eight shares because of splits and, and yesterday they closed at $96. Anybody do the math there? It's only $800 on a $20 investment. How many of you bought stock in 94 and still I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that, that's, that's the history of life. So why has the company been successful? Uh, the company's been successful for a, a lot of reasons, but there are two primary reasons. Number one, it is a business strategy that was different than our 40 or so competitors. And the second was a culture, a winning culture that, that, that helped to solidify and build the organization. So let's talk about the strategy first. Uh, in the early 1980s, as we were beginning to learn about the business, we spent lots of time in stores. I always spent time, we always spent time out there in the field where all the action was. And, and it was very clear there were not a lot of farmers shopping in our stores. There were lots of other people. But they were hard to define. There were doctors and lawyers and factory workers and, and bus drivers and you know, from all walks of life. And we really didn't exactly understand what the common ground was originally, but we knew they were different. And then we spent a lot of time studying our numbers. I remember sitting at the kitchen table with these great big green reports and going through, you know, page by page, looking at what we're selling and where we're selling it. And it, it didn't take us too long to come to the conclusion that everything Almost everything that had to do with production agriculture was in a slow decline. The products were in a slow decline. And all these other products that didn't exactly relate to production agriculture were in a slow increase, sometimes a dramatic increase. And just to give you a little walk around the store, uh, when you look at our parking lot, you would see that half or two thirds of the, of the vehicles in the parking lot are two part pickup trucks. Well, one of the big products we were selling at that time were crossover toolboxes for pickup trucks. And it continues to be a great business today. And then we were selling, we continue to sell tractor paint. You know, John Deere Green and International Red and so on. But we were also selling tractor paint for tractors that are not being manufactured anymore. That indicates a lot of antique tractors. And then we were selling a lot of air compressors and a lot of welders, which may or may not be used in agriculture. And then on the other side of the store, the pet business. Everything to do with dogs and cats is growing like crazy. And, and, and then you go back and the, the equine product, anything to do with horses is growing, just tremendously. And then the, the bird feeding and the, and the uh, men's work clothing, all these things that didn't tie into production agriculture, all it's growing. And, and it, it, all of a sudden it dawned on us, hey, there's somebody else out there, a different customer, and we define that customer as a hobby farm. And today I can tell you exactly what that customer is, and it's exactly the direction the company has taken. Uh, a hobby farmer is somebody who has acreage, more than an acre, typically a family unit, husband, wife, and children, always have dogs and cats, typically have some fencing around their property, may very well have animals, you know, chickens, turkeys, goats, sheep, horses, uh, and, and they most likely drive a pickup truck, they may very well have an antique tractor, they enjoy the rural lifestyle. They're making their income somewhere else, they have regular jobs, but they enjoy the rural lifestyle. So that, that was the hobby farmer. So here we got, we, we got this different strategy and our 40 or so competitors didn't recognize this or didn't recognize it clearly. So we went 
down that path. That meant we were going to put stores in different places. We were closing stores in small Midwestern towns. 